So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of LTI, I'm very happy to welcome you all for this webinar uh, titled Engaging Learners as Thinkers. So before we move on to the session, I uh, would like you to watch a prom clip of LTI. So thank you so much for watching our uh, Chrome clip. Uh, a few announcements to the audience. Uh, we have a chat facility here where you can uh, chat, uh, express your ideas. If you have any questions, uh, we have a question answer uh, session. Maybe after the presentation of, from the speaker, we'll have uh, time for the questions. So uh, I request you to use the chat uh, to ask your questions. Uh, I request you uh, people not to use the chat for uh, sharing your personal details like phone numbers or email lines. Thank you. So we have with us today uh, two moderators, Dr. Uh, M. Ilankumaran and Dr. R. Abhilasha, uh, President and the Secretary of uh, Entai Kanyakumari Chapter. So I request uh, Dr. Abhilasha to take over. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Praveen, sir. Uh, you may start, ma'am. Okay, thank you. So, uh, hello, everyone. Good evening. In the English Language Association of India 
is happy to host its uh, 55th webinar series on the topic enhancing learners as thinkers we as human beings we are basically self reflective and thinking is an integral part of our existence critical thinking and learning are inseparable entities in fact the more we learn the greater we become as thinkers so both complement each other and whoever it may be if a person wants to improve or enhance his or her communication skills our thinking is mandatory we need to sharpen our thinking skills so with this few cues on this topic and uh, let me take the privilege of introducing uh, today's chief guest dr richard harrison Dr Richard is based on London and uh, currently he is working in Oman in the uh, German University of Technology and Right and he has to his credit uh, several research articles are published and presented uh, both at the national and international forums and uh, he is an ELP expert a specialist and he is the founder and director of convert publishing and he has the credit of working in several countries almost uh, um, you know so many countries in the middle east especially if i'm right and uh, uh, it's a great honor uh, to have such an eminent personality as the guest speaker of today's session and uh, uh, to put it in the nutshell it's not possible to enlist all his potentials to put it in the nutshell um, dr richards is a prolific writer an oracious reader an eminent speaker and an excellent language trainer as well uh, so we are really happy uh, uh, for uh, um, mr richards being our chief guest and native speaker uh, to grace this 55th webinar series and for having bestowed us with his valuable presence and i take this opportunity to welcome dr richardson on behalf of uh, uh eltai and on my own behalf of the secretary of kanyakumari chapter uh you are cordially invited sir to this session and uh, uh let me take this opportunity uh, to welcome uh, a, a passionate and enthusiastic researcher who has to his credit uh, uh, more than 200 publications in the known and reputed journals including uh, you know, ugc carlister journals Uh, scopus uh, journals uh, ssca journals and uh, uh, has hundreds of citations uh, and a h index of uh, uh, 12 who is none other than uh, the president of our eltai chapter kanyakumari uh, professor elungumaran and i'm so particular and um, i'm much obliged to dr pravin sam the host of this meet uh, i mean dr pravin is working as uh, an associate professor in ssn college uh, chennai and uh, he is such an amiable and uh, fable personality who has been so cooperative uh, right from the beginning and supportive throughout and i welcome you sir and uh, before i wind up i take this opportunity to welcome each and every member of the eltai family to this uh, discussion forum and of course uh, all the illustrious luminaries erudite scholars uh, uh, and enlightened educators uh, to this uh, virtual platform of knowledge sharing and wisdom and uh, uh, so so uh, all are really invited and thank you very much And now let me hand over the session to Dr. Richardson, uh, who is going to end. Uh, thank you, everyone. Happy learning. Over to you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for this uh, very nice uh, introduction. Uh, I hope you can hear me. The picture seems to have frozen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Your sound is clear. Go on, sir. Yeah, my picture seems to have frozen. Let me try again. All right, okay. Well, thank you very much for that very nice introduction, and uh, thank you also to El Tai for inviting me to to present this uh, webinar. And it's really a great pleasure to be able to do that. 
I'm actually here in London. I live part of the time in Oman. So at the moment I'm in London. It's just after midday here. So I can say good afternoon to you. And um, well, let's press on with the presentation. I'm going to be talking today about engaging learners as thinkers. And later on, I'll be, I'll talk first of all, what we mean by thinking, what do we mean by critical thinking? And then later on, I'll be looking at ways that we can introduce uh, thinking activities uh, into the language classroom. So I'm going to start off with a little task here um, for you. If you would have a look at this uh, email, which I received a few uh, weeks ago. And my task is very simple for you. Should I delete or open the following email? So I'll give you just uh, a minute to read it. Right. OK. Now, I wonder what you decided. Was it delete or open? Well, I'm pretty sure you all said delete. And I'm interested in actually why you chose that option. Why did you choose to delete this particular email? And there are a number of reasons we can point out here. First of all, it's supposed to come from Microsoft, but the email address of the sender is a Hotmail address. It doesn't sound very authentic. Um, is the, the sender is uh, using a generic greeting, dear Microsoft user, uh, not my personal name. And then we notice there are a number of errors here, language errors. Uh, this is the last time we notified you. Of course, it should be we will notify you. Uh, then further on, uh, in your account, reasons are. So there should be a new sentence there. And then uh, to permanent delete, of course, it should be deletion. So you start to think, well, wait a minute. Would a big company like Microsoft send out emails with uh, language mistakes in. So you probably think, no, no. And then at the, finally, at the bottom here, um, there's this sense of urgency. Uh, account disconnection will take place today, 12 midnight, if, you, if issue is not resolved. OK. So I think you all agreed that this is probably a scam email. And I'll look at these uh, as a very useful resource a little bit later on. But it's interesting because what we actually did when we made our decision to delete <clears throat> was going through critical thinking. We were actually uh, engaged in critical thinking, trying to decide if this was genuine or not genuine. And by the way, this is a very useful activity to carry out with students. But we'll look at that uh, in, a, in a moment. So I want to have a, just a general talk um, about types of thinking and critical thinking before I move on to looking at ways of introducing thinking into the classroom. So we could say there are these types of thinking, everyday thinking, scientific thinking, creative, abstract, concrete, divergent and convergent, and also critical thinking. But I believe that out of these, the two most uh, important are perhaps everyday thinking and critical thinking. I think the others um, are really included in critical thinking, perhaps not creative thinking, but certainly scientific thinking, abstract thinking. They all come under the umbrella, I think, of critical thinking. Everyday thinking is different. This is the kind of thinking we do throughout the day when random thoughts come into our heads, rather like clouds, and they drift into our minds, and they drift out again. They're, they're random, and they're involuntary. We don't want to think about these things. 
Now, critical thinking is very much non-random. It's actually very conscious thinking. We decide to think about a particular issue. So it is voluntary. It's also reflective, which means that we uh, spend time thinking about the issue. We think about it deeply. And another adjective we can use about critical thinking, it's reasonable, which means that it depends on reason uh, to decide what to believe or what to do. Another point, um, it's rarely taught explicitly. People assume, oh, it's something people pick up along the way in the course of their education. I don't think this is the case. It's an integral part of academic life. Um, it's everything that a student does at college or university or school to some extent involves critical thinking. Whether they're writing an essay or reading a textbook, uh, analyzing data, uh, taking part in a discussion or a debate, it involves critical thinking. Um, we can also put it within the context of 21st century skills. Now, these are the skills that are widely accepted as being necessary in the age of the internet for students or people entering the modern workplace. And here is a list of these items, uh, 12 skills. By the way, I've got a list, but a good critical thinker will take a list and put them into a classification. So having a list of items is useful, but not as useful as a classification. So this is another example of critical thinking, taking a, a number of items, seeing what they have in common, and then putting them into a classification or a uh, hierarchy. Okay, now then, another thing about critical thinking, it encourages what we can call cognitive biases, our examination of our cognitive biases, I should say. And these are biases that we have that we're not really aware of. And they're identified by psychologists, educational psychologists. And I picked out a few here of, of perhaps the most common one. So conformity bias, uh, sorry, conf confirmatory bias, conformity bias, hindsight bias and availability bias. And uh, confirmatory bias, I think we're all guilty of this. This is when we look for information, for data that supports our point of view, instead of looking at a broad range of data and then coming to a conclusion. Conformity bias, sometimes called group, groupthink, we want to agree with all our friends and colleagues, so we don't want to cause trouble. We tend to hold the same views as them, if we're not careful. Hindsight bias, well, I think, again, we're, a lot of us are guilty of that. We look back at something that has happened, like, for example, the coronavirus situation, and we look back and we say, oh, well, I know that should have happened. We should have done this. We should have done that. I knew that all along. So that is often a, a type of uh, bias. And then a final example is availability bias. We just get the information that is easily available, the information that we can find close at hand. We don't want to go into looking in a, a broader context. And we are guilty of this uh, individually, I believe, but also we can say that the uh, international media, for example, is guilty of this. And I rather like this um, slide produced by James Clear, the availability heuristic. Uh, heuristic, I think, is another word for shortcut. So what actually happens in the world? What is covered in the news? A very small segment of what happens in the world. And we can think of examples, I'm sure, of individual people that are focused on out of the seven billion in the world, 
or individual countries, two or three countries that are focused on out of the 200 or so countries that are in the world. So that's another kind of bias that we have to be aware of. Okay, and then one, a couple more things about critical thinking before we move on to the practical side. Um, it encourages the search for facts, data, and evidence. So we don't come to opinions or make statements until we have got this uh, information, the facts, the data, and the evidence. And another thing, it encourages skepticism and doubt. And skepticism is not the same as being cynical. I think it's rather a positive uh, virtue to be skeptical or doubtful. And it means when anything is put in front of us, like, for example, some data is put in front of us, or um, a proposal, or a project, or a report, or a, an opinion essay, or whatever, we have to approach it with, first of all, being rather skeptical. And you can see from this cartoon here that this woman is not very uh, convinced by this data. And, of course, this leads on to the next step, which is asking questions. And here, I think, is where we're coming to the, the actual heart of critical thinking, asking questions. And not just uh, factual questions or lower order questions like what, where and when, uh, but higher order questions, if you're familiar for example, with this pyramid, uh, Bloom's taxonomy, at the higher order, we have questions like, how can you assess? Why do you think? What would happen if? So these are more challenging questions. Okay, so critical thinking is really about developing a mindset, a way of looking at the world, at challenging conventional wisdom, and using logic and evidence and data to get to the truth of a matter. And surely this is something very, very important for our students. They should develop this mindset. Now, let's move on to the next point. Uh, oh, by the way, I like to use this image of a crystal or a, a diamond to represent the, the kind of thinking that we uh, are interested in. Thinking that is clear, precise, sharp, incisive, even sparkling. So if we can get this kind of uh, thinking inside our students, that would be a wonderful thing. And the what we have at the moment, what I have uh, very often, and I found a lot with my students when I was in Oman, uh, often the thinking is rather woolly and muddled and unfocused, sloppy, even lazy thinking, rather like this cloud or a, 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 this image of a piece of cotton wool. So how do we get from that situation to the, to the crystal, to the very sharp, clear thinking? And this is where I'm going to introduce now four different approaches to this, four ways that we can introduce uh, thinking, critical thinking into our language classrooms. Okay, so the first one is to get students to think about their own thinking. This is metacognition. And I'll give you some examples of this in a moment. And then the second one is a little bit more intrusive. This has to, we have to find space in our crowded uh, curriculum, our crowded syllabus for this. We actually put in a critical thinking syllabus. So when I was teaching at the German University uh, in Oman, we didn't have really space for a critical thinking syllabus. We had to add it to study skills and academic English and other parts of the syllabus. Uh, um, two more uh, approaches. These are rather more flexible approaches. 
So critical thinking activities, which can be introduced into the classroom. These are practical activities or tasks, and they can take five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and they can fit around an existing program. And lastly, and very interestingly, we can just carry on doing what we're doing with our language exercises, but adding what I call critical thinking value to them. And I'll show you how we can do that, how we can add value to the teaching of vocabulary, the teaching of reading, uh, writing, and, and so on. Okay, so let's go on to thinking about thinking. Um, now, thinking about thinking, metacognition, is really about getting students to look out, step outside their bodies and look at themselves objectively and ask questions about the way they study, the way they come to decisions, and so on. How do we do this in a practical way in the classroom? Well, I think we introduce these uh, topics, we give them tasks. Um, I'll show you a worksheet in a moment. So we might want to choose the topic of making a decision. How do they come to a decision? How do they find a solution to a problem? What steps do they go through? Um, how do they complete a task? Again, if they have to accomplish a task, what steps do they go through in order to complete it? Uh, the next one, uh, preparing for an exam or learning a new skill. For example, if they're learning to drive or uh, learning a new language or learning how to use a particular device, um, a new device they've just brought. What steps do they go through? And then finally, we've mentioned already, overcoming personal biases. So in practical terms, how do we get students to reflect on these topics? I've, I've come up with a worksheet here, and this one is focusing on decision making. So we can say, um, think about a big decision you had to make recently, a new job, a new home, ending a friendship or a relationship, uh, etc. And then here's, this provides a bit of structure. By the way, this can be done in twos and threes, small groups of students uh, sharing I, uh, their, their thinking on these issues. So it's more of a structured discussion, uh, a guide for a structured discussion rather than a worksheet. What issue did you cite? What steps did you go through before you made your decision? And then how could you improve your decision-making process? We could do a similar one for the conformity bias. Again, here's a task. Think about an important issue that you and most of your colleagues, friends, agree on. For example, climate change, arranged marriages, importance of university education. Okay. Then think of three opposing arguments to your view on this issue. So getting them to look at the other side and to, and finally, to what extent have your friends or colleagues influenced your views on this topics? Are you affected by conformity bias? So for all of those topics that I mentioned, we could, we could produce simple guide, guided discussion sheets like this. And I think that's a very useful way of getting students to think about their own thinking. Okay, let's move on now to the second approach, which was the syllabus, introducing a syllabus. Um, I think of critical thinking as a bundle of skills, of sub-skills, rather than like uh, reading is a bundle of skills. It's not just one skill, it's a, a number of skills. Uh, writing, of course, uh, listening, speaking, study skills, and so on. So let's have a look at some of these sub-skills. And here are some related to arguments and opinions. So how do we build a strong argument? How do we look at both sides of an argument? And how do we support an opinion 
with examples, evidence, and reasons, and also sources. Now, um, I mentioned the German university in Oman when we had very bright students and they were full of opinions. They had lots of uh, things to say, but um, they were not so good at supporting their opinions with reasons and evidence and examples and so on. They tended to rely on emotion and exaggeration and personal anecdotes. So we want to move away from that towards um, these uh, evidence, examples, and, and reasons and sources to strengthen the opinion. Okay, another sub-skill is uh, definitions, defining terms. So if we're going to discuss an issue like poverty or uh, stereotypes or genocide, we need a very clear definition of what we mean by this term. And this helps the person speaking. It also helps the person who is uh, listening or reading what you have to say. So poverty, for example, we might use the United Nations definition of poverty, an income of $2 a day or less. So then it's clear when we carry on with our discussion. And the same with these other items as well. All right, commenting on data, we've already looked at this, asking questions, linking cause and effect, and avoiding false correlations. So because two things happen at the same time, that doesn't mean to say that there is a causal relationship between them. Uh, so we mustn't uh, be uh, misguided in that way. Uh, moving on now to problem solutions. So how do we uh, identify a problem and then find a solution to a problem and use criteria to make a choice? If we're going to make an intelligent choice. So, for example, if we want to buy a car, we might decide, well, the criteria are going to be price, uh, Comfort, uh, fuel economy, uh, color, um, reputation, reliability, and so on. And then we would rank these in order, and we would make our choice like that. I would call it, that's an intelligent choice. All right, and uh, we've already mentioned classifying skills or rocks or books or sports. Any items can be uh, class, any group of items can be classified. And um, analyzing a process, for example, the production of tea, it's a complicated process, um, but we can break it down into small steps, right from the picking of the tea leaves to uh, the production of the, the packets of tea or the, the tea bags at the end of the process. So all of the different steps and stages. And similarly with a procedure like sending a parcel, um, if you want to send a parcel from uh, India to the United Kingdom, for example, what are the steps that you need to go through? What is the procedure for writing uh, a dissertation or uh, a report? What are the steps that you would go through? Okay, and then the last of these um, uh, sub-skills I wanted to focus on, um, taking a text and distinguishing fact and opinion within that text, a newspaper article, for example, and thinking about thinking we've already mentioned. Okay, so all of these are elements which would go into our critical thinking syllabus. If we decided that we had space in the existing syllabus, and that's where we would put this. I just want to show you what I did in one of my books. There you see the critical thinking component that I put in alongside uh, writing skills and language focus. So all of these sub-skills I put in um, alongside um, there. Right, let's go on to the third approach. I'm 
keeping an eye on the clock. I don't want to overrun time because there might be time for questions at the end. Um, so a lot of tasks and activities that we can use, put into the classroom uh, when we have space uh, in the lesson. Um, a lot of these you are familiar with, I'm sure. Uh, on the right, I've put those skills, those thinking skills that these uh, tasks and activities will practice. So puzzles, for example, we can find lots of puzzles word, maths puzzles, situational puzzles, and so on, on the internet. And these are very good for training the brain. And, and we know that the more you do of these activities, the, the better you become at doing them. Uh, brainstorming is uh, creative thinking. Class debates, a very good way of building strong arguments. So getting students in teams of two to debate a particular topic. But first of all, they have to build their argument, either for or against a particular issue. Okay. And here are some more uh, quizzes, uh, reading texts, and so on. And those are the skills that they are practicing. We've already med mentioned uh, reading texts and distinguishing fact and opinion. Scientific experiments, very useful because that is really... Uh, the core of critical thinking, the, the scientific uh, method, but we don't have time to look at that. What I will do, I'll look at um, scam emails, advertisements and videos, and misleading data. I'll look at these in a little bit more detail. Okay, well, we've already looked at the scam email at the beginning. What I like about this activity is that we're actually turning the tables on the people who send these uh, irritating uh, emails. So we're actually getting something positive out of it. We're using them with the class, with the students, and getting them to, to, to uh, use their thinking capacity to think critically. And here's another example. Again, the generic greeting, language mistakes. This is supposed to come from PayPal, but it doesn't look a professional. There's no logo and so on and so forth. So how do we exploit this? Well, again, with a worksheet. And this is a, a worksheet you can use with any email. What does the sender want you to do? Why are you suspicious? List um, three reasons. And um, as I mentioned, these are the ones I came up with. In, in this case, they want you to click on a link. They might want you to reply, or they might want you to uh, send your bank details or send money even. And I was suspicious because of the unusual language and errors. There was no name or customer reference. And the design is very basic. There's no company logo. So scam emails are a very rich source for critical thinking, critical thinking activities. Another rich source are advertisements. And why advertisements? Well, they are, first of all, they're everywhere. So they're very easy to obtain on the internet, in magazines, newspapers, and so on. But when we think about advertising, the values of advertising are actually the opposite of what we're trying to teach our students. Now, let me explain this. The advertising advertisements are actually very subjective. They depend on emotion, exaggeration, misleading claims, and so on. And they don't usually give much evidence and sometimes they're not truthful at all. So this is the opposite of what we are trying to teach our students. We want them to be objective and to look for evidence and, of course, to be uh, truthful. So I've got a lot of examples you can find. Um, here, um, a lot of these old cigarette advertisements seem to use uh, doctors in the, in the pictures. Uh, 
usually saying that cigarettes are healthy or they're more healthy than another brand. Um, and then the bottom left, I think this comes from an Indian newspaper. It's ad advertising an anti-coronavirus mattress. So what this does, it prompts a lot of questions, doesn't it? And so this, again, is what we're trying to get our students to do as, as thinkers, as critical thinkers, is to ask questions, difficult, probing questions. And then um, sales advertisements and then these very cheap deals. There's always a catch if you look very carefully. Um, and those are just examples. Let's go back to this example of the, of the lady here who's... Um, using the cream to get rid of uh, wrinkles. There's a grammatical mistake there. We will we'll leave that. So this prompts a lot of questions, doesn't it? And, and to help us, here's a, another worksheet. What claim is the advertiser making about their product? Uh, think of three critical questions you could ask the advertisers. So we might say, first of all, well, uh, the claim is that the cream will improve the appearance of your skin if you apply it a few minutes. Uh, but there's such a difference between the two um, pictures. You might say, well, do these photos really show the same person? How long do you need to apply the cream? How many days or weeks? What test did you carry out? Where is the evidence? So if we had the chance, these are the kind of questions we would put to the advertiser. Okay, and the third example I wanted to draw your attention to is um, misleading data. And um, I think at the moment, unfortunately, in, in the age of uh, coronavirus, we've got a mass of data all around us. And some of it, I think, is very misleading. But what we mean by misleading data is data that is inaccurate. Uh, it might have the uh, wrong graphical representation using a, a bar chart where you need to have a pie chart, for example, or a pie chart where you need a graph. Uh, another thing that we find with data is that people will cherry pick. They will take the data that just suits their argument and ignore uh, other data, and um, we can we've we've called this earlier. We've called this confirmational bias. Here are some more. Not comparing like with like. I'll come on to that in a moment. Uh, lack of context or perspective, and this is similar to availability bias we mentioned earlier. And then the y-axis not starting at zero. I'll just ex give you more examples of these last three in the list. So not comparing like with like. Um, if we're going to compare apples, we have to compare them with other apples, of course, and not with pears. Um, so coronavirus, um, these, this is old data, by the way, but um, these are cases by country. And we can see from this that the United States, according to this, is doing very badly. The total number of cases was very high. And then if we look down the list, Austria, for example, was quite low, only 13,000 cases. Um, but, of course, here we, we are comparing the United States, which has a very large population, with Austria, which has a very small population. So we're not comparing like with like. And you would think, well, this is pretty obvious, but this, is, this sort of data is, is given to people um, a lot, I find. So if we, a better way of looking at this data is on the right here, uh, reported cases per million. Okay, so this of course is taking into account the, the size of the country. And in this situation, then we can see that uh, Austria is actually doing slightly worse than the United States. The United States still not doing very well, but it's, it's, um, it's not as bad. It's not at the top of the list. 
as I say, this is old data, so things have changed. Um, not looking at the wider context, so just taking a small bit uh, and not looking at the wider picture. And literally, if you look at those men dancing, if you don't see the context, then you don't get a full uh, understanding of what they're doing. They actually, uh, they just come out of a factory and they're celebrating at the end of the day, it seems. Um, but we let's have a look at a, um, a graph now. And if I showed you this from the UK, uh, COVID deaths per day in the UK from February up to more or less now until the end of last month, you would think, oh, well, the UK is not doing too badly. Um, there were 82 uh, deaths in uh, the end of February. And now the number seems to have gone way down and almost to, to zero. So we're doing pretty well. But of course, this isn't the full picture. And we need to look back uh, perhaps to the beginning of the year. And then we see that actually we've had a very bad um, uh, time with uh, coronavirus. We've had um, a lot of deaths per day in January and February, and only now it's starting to come down. So we're looking at uh, the broader picture. In fact, if we wanted to look at the whole picture, it would be better to go right back to the beginning of the pandemic back in March of last year. And then you see we've had in the UK, we've had two waves and we're now just now coming to the end of a second wave. And uh, hopefully, of course, this is the, the last wave. We're not going to have any more after this, but um, who knows? So you can see how this can be mis misused, how you can take that part of the graph that suits your purposes. Uh, you don't have to show the whole picture. So this is something we should guard against. And then the y-axis not starting at zero. This happens sometimes. So this um, bar chart shows uh, interest rates and they're going um, up. It looks quite sharply. Um, but in fact, uh, if we start the graph, uh, the bar chart at zero, then we notice that the rise is actually very slight. In fact, you can hardly notice it. So again, this is quite dangerous. You can, uh, it's misleading. And here's an example of a newspaper, the, the Times newspaper in the UK, um, boasting about its sales figures. And it's comparing the, their sales figures to those of the Daily Telegraph, one of its rivals. And we see, oh, there's quite a big gap between them. But then over on the right, if we look at the y-axis, we see that it doesn't start at zero. It starts at 420,000 copies a day. So that's an example of how it can be misused. Right, OK, I'm just checking the time, and I'm running out of time. So I better go through very quickly this last approach to introducing critical thinking into the language classroom. So um, I'm going to be looking at vocabulary, grammar and syntax, reading texts and writing. So how can we add value to this in order um, to introduce critical thinking? Well, let's look at vocabulary. So these are the ways, some of the ways that we might teach vocabulary using pictures and objects, matching pictures with words and filling in gaps and so on. And they're all good ways of um, teaching um, vocabulary, useful ways. But if we want to add a bit of critical thinking or into that, making it a little bit more challenging, uh, we can use activities like this. So grouping the words, as we've already discussed, putting them into categories like, like fruit, for example, or making uh, a proper classification chart. Uh, another way would be to grade items. So adjectives, for example, like big, huge, enormous, uh, or nouns like um, puddle, lake, sea, ocean, 
and so on. And then instead of just matching a word with a meaning, getting students to um, use the sentence to demonstrate its meaning. So these are all more challenging activities that we can do to our existing, we can add to our existing teaching. We get the same approach with grammar. Instead of focusing on um, deductive instruction of grammar, giving students the rule, uh, we could focus a little bit more on inductive instruction. So giving the students lots of examples and getting them to work out what the, the rules are. And instead of gap fills and multiple choice and so on, getting students to complete a sentence. So you give them an example like this, Rishi was upset because, and they fill in the rest of the sentence. There are probably things that you do already, but it's good to know that as you do this, you are introducing a, a higher level of, of thinking, a higher order of thinking. Uh, reading, similarly, reading comprehension, we can take a very simple factual questions or get students to fill in gaps and so on, or transfer information from the text into a chart. Uh, but if we want to introduce critical thinking, we can uh, add higher order questions, more challenging, more difficult questions. And we can also look at the text, look at the structure of a text, look uh, how it's organized, and look for the author's view, and so on. And finally, writing, just very quickly, uh, the best way to teach people critical thinking is to teach them to write. This is a statement from Jordan Peterson, uh, who's a, a clinical psychologist. Uh, but I thought this was a very interesting statement. And why would it be the best way to teach people critical thinking, to teaching them to write? Well, if we look at what writing involves, writing, I mean, a, a lengthy piece of writing, maybe academic writing, it involves all of these things, reflection, research, organization, careful use of language, and then re rewriting, being objective about what we've written and looking at it afresh, rewriting, and also lead, listening to feedback. Again, that's um, being objective about what we have written and learning from uh, others. Right, okay, so I've come to a very um, quick conclusion here. Um, just to summarize the main points I've made, uh, teaching thinking is about developing a mindset. Uh, thinking can and should be taught explicitly. We can't depend on students picking it up along the way in the course of their uh, education at school or college or university. And I'll just finish up just showing you some of the books that I've developed on this theme that you might be interested in looking at. Uh, framework and Framework First two different levels, academic writing and critical thinking. And uh, also there's my uh, website, if you'd like to have a look at that, Canford Publishing, and uh, have some YouTube videos. And there is um, my email if you have questions, although I believe they're coming through on WhatsApp as well. Uh, but afterwards, maybe, if you wanted to um, have any discussion, I'm happy to um, receive your emails. So thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. And I'll, I'll hand back to our moderators and uh, we'll see if you have some uh, questions. Right, I'm not quite sure how I hand back. Um, ah, okay.
So I request uh, Dr. Elangovanan to uh, ask the questions asked by the audience. Good evening. Uh. Good, e good evening, one and all. Except uh, Dr. Richard Harrison, his friends and students of our home, it's a good afternoon. I am pleased to be with you all to have listened to Dr. Richard Harrison. The topic, engaging listeners, engaging learners as fingers, was timely, and the way it was presented added a flavor to it. Dr. Richard, the talk was in such a way that it has exhilarated the minds of everyone listen to you. Oh, well, that's, that's kind Literally, of... Actually, Finger has two basic meanings for us. First, Finger is a person who thinks deeply and seriously. Second, Finger is the one with the highly developed intellectual powers, especially one whose profession involves intellectual activity. Example, Aristotle and Confucius, etc. To think means to ponder, to communicate to oneself, to one's mind. It's trying to find a solution to your problem. In fact, your delivery was so engaging that we lost track of time. And of course, you have widely covered all the things from thinking task to thinking about thinking, in which you have almost covered everything with a superb worksheet and other aspects. Dear friends, I strongly hope that every one of you is happy and satisfied as a relevant topic has been taken up today. Dear sir, now it's time for me to direct to you the chosen few questions from the audience. Uh, the first question, it's from Dr. Seema Singh. Doesn't every aspect of intellectual growth and development besides the wonders it can do in making language learning more enriching, exciting and rewarding? This is question from Dr. Seema Singh. Uh, sorry, I didn't catch the question there. Again, I, let me repeat, sir. Doesn't, doesn't, can you hear me, sir? Can you hear me? Uh, not so well, no. Can, can, me, I, can I pick on one of the questions I find here in the um, in the webinar? Yes, 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 yes. Yes, sir. Actually, I, I, I pointed out the question. Okay. Yes. Yes, yes. Please, sir. Okay. Go ahead. So, what critical thinking abilities can be introduced at the school level curriculum? I think a lot of yes. the ones I've mentioned can be, and. Um, we can start even at very low levels, I think, with some of these activities. They just have to be adapted to our students. So I, I think, um, particularly with these that add value to language activities, these are things that we can uh, introduce at the, at the lower levels. OK, there are five, four or five questions out there, sir. Dr. Professor Ramani has asked one question. Uh, uh, linear thinking versus lateral thinking. Is this different yes. critical subskill? It's a question yes. from Professor Ramani. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. Seema Singh. I'm sorry, I don't have the question here. Okay, sir, I'll, let me ask you, sir, let me ask you. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, I can, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, this is question from Professor Ramani. Uh, linear thinking versus lateral thinking. 
Is this difference a critical subskill? Well, it's, I think it's another way, or another approach to thinking like those that I mentioned at the beginning, like uh, abstract and concrete um, and convergent and divergent. I think this is another dichotomy. And uh, yes, certainly it's an element of, of critical thinking, I believe. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Actually, another question from Dr. Vinod K. Chopra. What critical thinking abilities can be introduced at the school level curriculum? Well, I think most of the things that I've mentioned can be introduced at the school level, um, particularly adding value to what we're already teaching in the, in the language um, side of our, 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 in the language exercises that we're introducing into our classrooms. Okay. Um, and then what else? Uh, yes, certainly that can, that's what we can do at the, at the, at the lower level. And in okay. fact, all of those things, even the advertisements, the scam emails, uh, all of that, all of those types of activities, I think they work well at, at school okay, level. Okay, okay right, right. right, sir. Right. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Another question which is interesting, I mean, it's from uh, nowadays, uh, 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 Sargero Eknath, how to inculcate critical thinking among people who don't want to use their brain? Now, how I'm sorry. To inculcate this, how to inculcate critical thinking among people who don't want to use their brain. Ah, well, that's a, <laughs> that's a very good, um, that's a challenge. How you motivate students, you give them something that's relevant to them. Uh... <laughs> Hello, sir. Uh, Yelling Commander, sir. I think there are some connectivity issues. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Richard, sir. He has left the session. Are there with the. Uh, yeah, let's move on. To the, let's okay. move on to the vote of thanks, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Uh, let me proceed with vote of thanks. Okay, let me now move on to the final segment of the session. Vote of thanks. Uh, dear Dr. Richard Harrison. I'm grateful to you oh. for allotting time for us from your busy schedule to address all of us. No doubt yes. the presentation was a terrific that would be cherished by everyone for so long. We the teachers will um, engage our learners as thinkers hereafter. On behalf of my Eltoy family, I wish to extend my hearty thanks to you, sir. Thank you. Well, thank you, sir. I much. also thank you. I thank you, sir. Thank you. I also thank each and every one of Eltai family at all levels. I would like to thankfully mention that Professor Mohanraj, Professor Ilango, Professor Ramani, and others who are encouraging me to take up this venture. My hearty thanks are due to Dr. Seve Pradeep Singh, Dr. Praveen Sam, and Dr. Susay of Eltai. I thank every one of them who have been closely associated with me for more than a month for the smooth and successful contact of this webinar. Thanks for the opportunity given to us. I place on record my thanks to all the audience, all one and all today, with a heart full of thanks to the members of my home chapter, Eltai Kaniyamari chapter. I am Dr. Milangamaran, Professor of English, Noorul Islam Center of Higher Education, President of Kaniyamari Eltai chapter signing out on LTI webinar 55 and bringing you all back to Dr. Praveen Sam. Thank you very Thank you much you. indeed. Thank you. I'm sorry that we lost contact at the end there and I didn't hear the questions properly. Oh. But it's been a great pleasure and thank you very much. No problem, sir. Thank, thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. All right, okay. then. Thank you, thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you. Let's go back. to. Okay. So thank you, uh, Elaine Kumaran, sir, for that moderating. So dear participants, 
uh, the webinar for the next week is on new education policy and open and distant le distance learning system challenges in ELT. So I uh, welcome you all to participate in this session as well. Thank you. Have a good evening.